So in this segment, we're going to be discussing kind of some of the Labour defenders, the ones that are defending these pro-austerity policies, defending this painful budget that Starmer was talking about. And this is just kind of the height of embarrassment, in my opinion. This can only get worse before they get better. And that, I realise, was the speech I've been waiting, I think, over 10 years for a British Prime Minister to deliver. I mean, the last time it was delivered was, I think, George Osborne. So, you know, you have been waiting over 10 years because the last time we heard these kind of speeches was back in, like, 2010, 11. And I just remind you again, before you waste tuppence, uh, accusing me of footballification or client journalism or all the other things that we used to point out happening when the various lies and... Um, atrocities were being committed on the country by the last several governments. I said the same thing for about an hour and a half about Rishi Sunak. And I have in the past been more than happy to castigate leaders of the Labour Party. I'm responding... I mean, the only one you went after, I think, was Jeremy Corbyn, really. So unless... unless I don't remember you body slamming Ed Miliband. Think ...entirely to one man, one speech, one government and one vision. And I really, really like what I see. Oh, yeah, you know, short-term pain. Where have I heard that one before? You're really happy with short-term pain. Is it because, you know, you're not going to face a tax increase? Is that why you're so happy? And I can't... I can't articulate to you how weird that feels. I can't articulate to you how scared I am even to say those words out loud. How many times have we referenced that brilliant line in the film, the John Cleese film, Clockwise, about it being the, the hope that gets you? It can cope with the despair. I can cope with the despair. It's the hope that gets... I've never seen someone so excited over a potential austerity budget. Never in the history of the game have I seen someone who's supposedly um, centre-left get excited by this stuff. And there hasn't been any hope. You've got people prominent on the political stage dedicated to breaking things. The, the equivalent, if you like, of the Farage rioters, the people who have gone from setting fire to our membership of the European Union and now want to set fire to the our membership of the European Convention on Human Rights to bring us down to the left. I mean, you've got Mr. Make Brexit Work. Are you, are you a fan of that? You know, he is, in effect, supporting a pro-Brexit party in, in the Labour Party. ...level of Russia and, and Belarus. And we have had government after government after government who were dedicating all of their energies to appeasing people like that. Keir Starmer barely acknowledged their existence today because he was busy talking about apprentices and he was busy talking about firefighters and police officers and doctors and nurses and healthcare professionals and you and me and people that actually want to be governed who don't wake up every morning gnashing their teeth about the possibility of some desperate soul launching a dinghy from Calais in the hope of a right. I, d I don't I'm just listening to this speech I'm just like okay buddy like you've picked out the best bits from it and you're kind of just running with that but again like do you miss the bits where you know they talked about it he talked about it being a painful budget it's just crazy you know he goes on still politics uh, uh, as we haven't seen for a long time it's mm. not a slogan it's a deliberate attempt to take money from this constituency of people and put it there instead because mm -hmm. the, the the finances are not infinite it's it's not rhetoric it's not sloganeering it's 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 the politics of detail mm. and that's i think what i found refreshing about about the entire speech um and of course as many of my texters are pointing out pensioners are going to be treated by the doctors who have just received a yeah, sort of morale boosting pay rise you from. know he he wanted to make that that case didn't mm. he? he wanted to sit there and say actually look this is the political choices but pensioners use all of these public services too and they are and it's going to be great because they're going to use them even more because some of them won't be able to afford their heat to heat them houses to heat their houses so they're going to become sick and they're going to need those doctors even more those resources even more now all vital uh, to our future. So yes, but I think you know the, the honeymoon for Keir Starmer is going to come to an end. Uh, I think in the next few weeks, in terms. Of I do. I do wonder how many families, um, how many families have grandparents who are reliant on the winter fuel payments. I do wonder what their reaction is to all of this. Um, and this is probably some of the best, some of the best defence of Starmer I've seen. Say this: I've been a Labour uh, voter all my life, but I'm having doubts about this. Uh, Steer Karma now. Isn't it funny it wasn't in his in his manifesto because I you know about uh, taking the winter fuel from the pensioners. But the whole point you know, of the speech was to stress that the twenty two billion pound hole in the public finances was unexpected. So in a so a way yeah. that, that gives him a free pass on manifesto pledges in a way. Yeah, no no it doesn't because we knew this was gonna happen. 
the IFS talked about it. So, you know, when he talks about don't call me a client journalist, etc. You, you kind of are, pal, because we all knew about this big black hole in the budget. We didn't know how big it was, but we knew it was there. It was creeping up. So this argument of, oh, well, you know, we didn't know it was there. Nah, you knew. You either you you either read it and you knew it because it was everywhere in the news, or you're inc completely incompetent at doing your job and doing basic research. And you should not be in that chair. You should not have a job covering current affairs because you're that incompetent that you can't use a Google search that you barely cut, saw in the debates when the SNP were talking about it, when Applied were talking about it. You're that incompetent at your job. You best take which one, because I'd rather be malicious than incompetent in that scenario. <laughs> Do you think in four years or five years when he's up for parole again, and I, I, I say that sarcastically, you know, yeah, you know, when he's up in four or five years, do you think the pensions are going to stand by him again? I you don't know. know. Do you? No, they won't. I'll well, I, I tell you what, I'd, I'd love to hear people, pensioners coming on to talk to you and to see how many reactions you get. Oh, yeah. Well, we did. I think we did two hours on that last week, and it was, it was, it was largely mixed. But respectfully, John, you don't sound as if you're paying much attention to the speech that we've just heard. You're cross about something that happened a couple of weeks ago and you're still cross no, about I, it. I'm cross about... I mean, he talked, Starmer talked about more pain coming. About, I'm cross about when, a, when, a, polit when, a, when a, uh, a politician tries to re be elected for prime minister, yes. that they don't lie. And he, 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 everyone's saying he doesn't lie. He's lied, he's lied. When, Why did they come when, out and say, when I'm elected, I will, I, I've got to take the winter fuel to... Yeah, because the, uh, they said there'll be no more austerity. That's what they said. So they did lie. Because the public finances are much worse than Labour expected before entering government. I'll tell you one last... With my God, man, this man's so dumb, he would have fell straight for George Osborne's rhetoric in 2010. That's how stupid this man is. He's lost my vote. I, I, he's lost my vote. He didn't have it, did he? And he's lost, the, he's lost the vote of a lot of pensioners. So a guy who's claiming, you know, fair enough, he might be lying, he was claiming that he was a lifelong um, Labour supporter... And, and now, you know, you've got James O'Brien here doubting the validity of um, this person's vote, you know, what they're saying. You know, James O'Brien, a guy who voted for Boris Johnson to be mayor of London twice, by the way. Well, we will see. We, we will see. But, but, um... We'll see. We will see, yeah. And I'll come back to you well, in four why, years. What are you so you? cross about, John? It was a really interesting because speech. He's he... explained why there has to be a withdrawal of winter fuel payment. You might not agree with it, but you shouldn't let it get to you on this sort of level. I mean, what if this is a person who's going to be impacted by the cut? Should they not be mad? Don't don't be angry, dude. You know, this thing that might impact you. Why are you mad for, bro? You know, like, this, this is the guy who kept talking about Brexit endlessly. Why are you so mad about it, bro? You know, it's almost like politics affects people's lives. This is just completely brain dead. It does, it does, because it's always the pensioners. Well, you all didn't vote, vote for people. him, that, did you? Didn't, you did Did you really vote for him? Because you sound like you hate him. I, I, well, to, to be honest, I, yeah. I, I, I am beginning to now. See the... it's, just, it's just madness. Oh, you know, oh, I bet you really didn't vote for him anyways. Just the maddest defence I've ever seen. Uh, we move on to Ian Dunderhead. Um, you know, talking about the party political strategy of the Starmer speech is obvious and well understood, but his central argument is undeniable. A situation where the PM is having to check prison places daily during rights is symptomatic of a broken country, which is true. That, that I agree with. He says, you can quibble over how honest Labour was during the election and in particular its decision to back tax cuts they knew weren't affordable. But the basic point he's making is the Conservatives F the economy. That is simply and objectively and understood to be true, which again is true. But that doesn't give Labour carte blanche to do whatever they want. Obviously, it does not give them that. Um, especially when, as he says here, Labour backed one of these policies that he claims were unaffordable, that is part of the economic black hole. Makes zero sense. When we look at an actual professor of economics here, someone who does have expertise in the field, he says, so Rachel Reeves thinks that cutting and burning the UK economy is an appropriate strategy to make the economy grow. So where are the consulting papers and the experts she has consulted who back this approach? I know of none. Maybe Minford is um, her go-to nut job. Who else? No, he goes on to say, Seems beholden on Starman Reeves to provide supporting studies for the cutting they are about to pursue. Who are the economists, private sector academics who back them? Where are the papers, the literature, etc.? Um, none I know. Keynes shows this is an error, which again is true. You have an actual expert saying this. You know, Ray, um, Starmer himself knowing this. Over the last six years, we took difficult, sometimes painful decisions in order to rebuild our economy, strengthen our banks, put our public finances in better order. Don't make the mistake we made in 2010 
after the financial crash, which was to think that the way through this is to go for austerity. There is a budget coming in October, and it's going to be painful. You know, this speech that, you know, James O'Brien lauded so much, the one that talks about austerity, talks about a painful budget coming up, and he's loving it, lapped it up. Why? Because it's Team Red. It's my team versus the enemy team. That's all they care about. My team, enemy team. <laughs> That's all they care about. Team Red versus Team Blue. You know, again, the Professor Danny Blanchflower talking about, I didn't vote for austerity. Um, what about the workers? Despite O'Brien talking about how pro this budget is for workers and other people, you've got an actual economist saying, what about the workers? Honestly. And, you know, the last the last tweet I want to talk about here, you know, actual a uh, guy who sometimes I clown because he deserves it. Sometimes he does really good work and deserves credit for it. This is one of those times where you know, he talks about it's an indictment of a generation of policymakers and politics. Uh, voters might be forgiven for thinking they've heard all this before. Indeed, they have since George Osborne in 2010. Ernie Bevin said he wanted to be the Ministry of Labour till 1990, i.e. set the terms of thinking of on industrial relations for half a century. It sometimes feel like, feels like Osborne will be Chancellor until 2050, no matter how many times his vision of politics, uh, uh, politics political economy fails. You have to wonder how much more tolerance for it there's going to be and if you remember George Osborne's uh, politics was that of austerity that of budget cuts that of um, you know essentially driving society into a ditch let's be honest now driving public services into a ditch um, you know more money for the rich etc I didn't mean to rhyme that but we move that's what we're seeing from Labour you know they're clamping down on non-doms they're saying they're going to get more tax offices for HMRC that, that's fine but in reality, they're not raising tax on people. There's not going to be a wealth tax, which is something I actually discussed in another video, how um, it is quite an effective uh, means for taxation. They're not doing these things. They're just punishing people. A minimum wage increase is good. Public sector pay increase is good. But if you don't increase that bottom threshold of tax, people aren't going to feel massively the benefits of these things. You know, he then goes on to say, if nothing else, politically, it was a huge contrast with the politics of optimism at last week's DNC. Instead, we now have things are going to be much worse. Uh, things are going to get worse before they get better. Strongest sections of the speech were his diagnosis of the problems of populism and how Tories fell, um, fell into that reap was authentically him and convincing, which they know the true, the true problem Labour will face will be populism. But, you know, going through this kind of George Osborne strategy of austerity is not going to be the way they resolve it. Very frustrating from Labour. Very frustrating from the ones who keep defending Labour. The ones who, you know, you got this guy O'Brien talking about stop getting so emotional, etc. Despite the fact that he got massively emotional over Brexit. He kept talking about it day after day after day after day. Endless, endless conversation about this. He clearly took it personally. Now, are we allowed? Are we now allowed to get mad over politics now that Team Red are in? I just, I'm, I'm bamboozled. I'm actually bamboozled by this stuff. Um, but anyways, I'm going to leave it there. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Like, comment, share, subscribe. And I guess this lot will have to wait for their victory lap. Guess you'll have to wait a little longer to take your victory lap, huh, Tanner?